Well, hello, everybody. Um, it's wonderful to see everybody. My name is Manuel Muniz. I'm the provost here at IE University. Uh, I'm also the dean of our School of Politics, Economics, and uh, Global Affairs. Uh, I'm delighted to see you, uh, to see you all here uh, on the 24th floor of this uh, tower. This is IE's undergraduate campus. So we have about 4,500 undergraduates here. I know a number of the people, uh, a good chunk of the people in the room are IE students, and then another very good chunk of the people in the room are from other institutions. So very welcome uh, to IE. I hope we have a, a, wonderful, a wonderful time and a wonderful engagement. I want to thank uh, the president of the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola, for being here. I've been following uh, her Madrid visit on social media, and you've been very busy, uh, but the good kind of busy, engaging with all of the institutions and authorities in Spain. Uh, we have a very, very intense European agenda in this country, including an upcoming presidency of the European Council. As you know, Spain will hold the presidency of the EU, uh, EU in the second half uh, of this year. An important presidency, they normally are, but this one in particular, because it will be uh, the last presidency before we enter a European electoral cycle as well. That might be one of the topics that we want to discuss. And I'm going to be extremely brief, but we meet here uh, in a very particular time, a fascinating time to be speaking about European politics uh, and global politics and global economics as well. On the external dimension, we have a war uh, raging in Eastern Europe of a scale and a severity that we haven't seen since the end of the Second World War. Uh, last week, we had a major, in fact, earlier this week, we had a major agreement on the supply of weapons to the Ukrainian army, unprecedented move on the part of the Allies. Uh, we have challenges in the southern border of Europe as well when it comes to security and migration. Uh, we have very important challenges on the economic agenda. As you know, the European Union took unprecedented measures to address both the COVID pandemic, but then the effects of the war uh, in Ukraine and in Eastern Europe on the European economy. So both on the external and the internal agenda, uh, we're living through extraordinary times uh, in Europe. Uh, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a number of people that have made this possible. Uh, first of all, the President for offering her time to us, but also the Spanish Office of the European Parliament and also the team here at IE that have tirely, uh, tirelessly worked uh, throughout the past few days in putting all of this together. So thank you uh, to all of them. Uh, we are, again, delighted to have you. I will leave it there, uh, Madam President. The floor is yours. You're going to have a wonderful conversation, and I hope you have a wonderful time and do ask a ton of questions and engage in the discussion because it's, it's not always that you get the head uh, of Europe's democratically elected parliament uh, to address you. So thank you so much again. And very sure, much. thank you. Thank you, President. Y sobre todo, gracias a vosotros, buenas tardes y bienvenidos a este encuentro que hemos llamado Pregunta a la Presidenta del Parlamento Europeo, que la tenemos aquí. Antes de nada, eso, daros las gracias porque sois más de 300 o casi 350 jóvenes que habéis acudido a esta cita y que sois los auténticos protagonistas Muchas del gracias. encuentro. Eh, algunos eh, sois estudiantes del Instituto de Empresa, otros alumnos de diferentes universidades públicas o privadas, también hay de institutos de formación profesional, de escuelas embajadoras, hay jóvenes de la ONCE, hay jóvenes del mundo rural, algunos que vienen de otros países que no son españoles y, y también hay jóvenes que están preparando su máster en medios de comunicación como Televisión Española, de la que yo soy una representación, o de periódicos como El País o ABC. En total, sois una nutrida representación de la juventud europea, que queremos que demuestre aquí sus inquietudes, sus preocupaciones por temas como el empleo, eh, como la paz, como la seguridad como las instituciones europeas y su forma de responder ante los retos del mundo actual y sobre todo queremos que lo paséis muy bien. Eh, nos decía también el rector que están con nosotros un grupo de eurodiputados que están 
por esa zona, me parece, y que también están encantados de estar aquí para escuchar, y están saludando, para escuchar y para, y para aprender sobre todo de vosotros y también de la, de la presidenta. Y cómo no, está con nosotros la presidenta del Parlamento Europeo, Roberta Mensola, que vosotros la conocéis de sobra, pero vamos a dar algunas pinceladas más sobre su figura. Ella es de Malta, es la eh, presidenta del Parlamento Europeo más joven, Además, es la primera mujer en 30 años y la tercera después de Simone Bale y de Nicole Fontaine, lo cual también le otorga más mérito. Hoy está aquí con nosotros dentro de una visita oficial que ha hecho a España y este era uno de sus encuentros más deseados y más esperados. Ella lo ha pedido expresamente porque quería tener ese contacto directo con la juventud y escuchar vuestras inquietudes y vuestras preocupaciones. President, Miss President Mesola. Welcome to Spain. Thank you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to be here. How is going your visit great, to Spain? Great, great. My trans, my, <laughs> my, I'm realizing my Spanish has improved dramatically from yesterday to today. <laughs> so I understood, I think, 95% of what you said, but my, uh, my machine doesn't work. So okay. if anybody's going to ask me something extremely technical in Spanish, I will need interpretation. Otherwise, perfect. Thank you very much. I'm super happy to be here. Uh -huh. I must say, I thank you for spending the beginning of your weekend with me. Uh, so, sorry to take up a little bit of your Friday afternoon. I don't know when I was a student, I would have uh, been very appreciative of my Friday afternoon being taken up with a random politician, but here we are. I thank you, thank you for, <laughs> for being here. Uh, I, this is my first official visit. Yes. Uh, to Spain, I have been uh, to Santander and to, um, uh, to Barcelona already, but in okay. Madrid, this is the first time since I was elected president, not before, I've been here before on holiday, etc. <laughs> but uh, I'm super happy to be here and I've had fantastic meetings, but I must say, this is usually my favorite meeting of any visit I do. I, I know. Uh, one of your fantastic meetings this morning was with, with the King of Spain. Absolutely. Yes, Felipe VI. Uh, we want to ask you what, what was the, the meeting. What do you, you think want me to say what we talked team? about? I won't tell you what we talked about. <laughs> yes. No, first of all, uh, I have met uh, with the king before when I was in yes. uh, Santander uh, and we had a very, very um, great discussion uh, on, on everything that is happening, preparing for the Sp Spanish presidency, as was said in the, in the introduction, the war that is going on in Ukraine, the need for unity, the need for Europe. Uh, I congratulated him on the speech he gave earlier this week yes. uh, on the fact that he is such a uniting uh, figure, on the fact that he places uh, Europe at the top of the agenda, on the fact that he's such a committed um, uh, European. And I must say, you are very, very lucky to have him as your king. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> are you ready for the question? Uh, yes, the, yes, the... go ahead. You can ask me anything okay. you want. <laughs> But I hope nobody has given you questions in advance and you can be open and not be over-prepared. <laughs> Let's see, who's going to start? Yes, yes eh, bravo. Eh, podemos empezar solo un... Os quería hacer unas indicaciones. Tenéis que ser muy, muy breves, eh, preguntas muy claras, muy concisas, como titulares que decimos los periodistas, para que os dé tiempo a hablar a cuantos más, mejor. Ok, solamente quería It's very prohibiros... Spanish thing to say, yes. muy brevemente. And then, you know. Muy brevemente. <laughs> Ella lo ha entendido perfectamente, you understand very well. Eh, sí. Así que espero que vosotros también lo hayáis entendido. La idea es que digáis vuestro nombre, que digáis de dónde sois. Yo he dicho más o menos que erais de grupos diversos y, y me gustaría que lo explicarais, de dónde venís. Eh, cual, cuando queráis hablar, levantáis la mano, os pasamos un micro y ya directamente hacéis vuestra pregunta. Ya sabéis, muy directa y muy breve. Creo que ya tenemos una, una voluntaria. Di tu nombre, por favor, y de dónde eres para que la presidenta escuche tu pregunta. Sí. Eh, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody, Mrs. President. Eh, my name is Anna. I come from the ONCE Social Group with other colleagues. Eh, eh, antes de, de nada quería agradecer el convenio que recientemente ha firmado con, con la ONCE y como decía somos un grupo de 15 personas que venimos del Grupo Social ONCE y del CERMI y queríamos trasladar pues, un par de inquietudes que, que tenemos. Eh, en primer lugar... La Comisión Europea aprobó en su programa de 2023 el lanzamiento de la tarjeta europea de discapacidad que saldrá a final de año con el objetivo de que sea reconocida con todo, por todos los Estados miembros. 
en el informe hacia eh, la defensa de la, la igualdad de, de, de derechos de, para las personas con discapacidad, la comisión, los eurodiputados pedían al Parlamento y a todos los Estados miembros eh, medidas efectivas y, y concisas, concretas, para que esta tarjeta llegara a, a buen puerto y que se tuvieran en cuenta pues, diferentes medidas legislativas. Al respecto, pues, nos gustaría saber cómo va a garantizar el, el Parlamento Europeo que, que todo esto se lleve a cabo, que se lleven a cabo estas medidas. Y luego, por otro lado... En la primavera de 2024 se van a celebrar las elecciones en Europa. Eh, hay muchas personas con discapacidad que no pueden ejercer su derecho a voto porque no pueden realizarlo de forma independiente y garantizando de que sea secreto. Es más, incluso hay personas con discapacidad que, que están tuteladas por otra persona y que pues pueden ejercer, pueden ver cómo su derecho a voto queda delegado ¿no? en, en otras personas. A, al respecto, también queríamos saber qué medidas eh, va, puede tomar el, el Parlamento para que esto no ocurra, para que las personas con discapacidad pueden, puedan votar en igualdad de, de condiciones en las elecciones de, de 2024 e incluso que personas con discapacidad puedan... Eh, presentarse a los diferentes eh, a, las, a, lo, a los diferentes eh, citas ¿no? eh, electorales. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. ping pong or representatives in Brussels. I have addressed them. I don't remember how many months ago, but uh, I really was quite impressed by the large number of representatives uh, from ONSE that came uh, to Brussels and met with myself and a number of members of the European Parliament, not only from Spain, but in other countries. Um, the disability strategy uh, of um, the European Commission and the fact that we are still extremely far away from ensuring equal access to people with disability in all member states. There is a big difference, Anna, between some member states and others. In some member states, um, very many um, steps have been taken in order to ensure, for example, with regards to physical disability, accessibility to buildings, something that I myself am dealing with at the moment. For example, uh, as President of the European Parliament, we have buildings which are not fully accessible to whoever cannot physically access them. With regards to, to voting, Uh, this is a discussion that has taken place and takes place in all countries, including my own, mm -hmm. where for many, many years um, uh, disability activists have asked for what is essentially a fundamental right, no? A right to, to be able, first of all, to vote and a right to be able to stand as a candidate. Uh, there is an ongoing discussion as to what is meant by a trusted partner, a trusted friend who can help you vote. Uh, in some countries, there is an electoral commission that uh, would decide that somebody is objective enough, but of course, in that case, your privacy is not guaranteed. While in other countries, it is possible for somebody either to vote on your behalf or for someone to vote with you. In 2024, uh, I would like to see more uh, activists engaged uh, in uh, being candidates themselves. We don't have enough uh, elected representatives who are uh, not only close uh, to um, activists in the disability sector, but those who have a disability themselves. We also have seen in some countries that uh, persons with a disability who are elected, uh, then uh, it would be good if they are re-elected at the end of the mandate. Uh, that is also a discussion that we're having in many, many countries. From the Parliament's point of view, uh, we are as open as possible to everybody which means that in 2023, uh, this year actually, we're already in 2023, yes, in this year, uh, in June, around June, uh, there will be the so-called European Youth Event, which is one of the largest youth events uh, in the world, which brings together thousands and thousands of activists uh, like yourselves in Strasbourg. I would ask you to come there. 
um, uh, to apply. You can already apply online to be selected to come there. And I hope that by then we would have done more, especially since 2023 is year of skills. Uh, and we have placed as a parliament uh, the rights of a person with a disability uh, as part of uh, the upskilling that is needed in Europe. On a personal note, I uh, grew up uh, with my closest cousin of mine who um, um, is deaf. So my first language growing up was a sign language hmm. that I still use myself when I speak to her. Uh, she uh, actually, uh, when you turn on the news every day at 8 p.m., you will see her doing the sign language for our, <laughs> for our daily news. She is my first cousin. I grew up with her. Uh, we are a few weeks born apart, mm -hmm. and she is one of the best examples of how you can really overcome your disability by saying, "This is an uh, I have a different ability, and I can do whatever I would like to do." Just society and politicians need to help me get there. Was that okay, Anna? The first part of your question I didn't hear properly. If I didn't answer it, you can ask it again. Okay. Ya sabemos otra cosa más sobre oh, ella y es hands. que habla también el lenguaje de los signos. Tenemos otra pregunta, creo por ahí, este chico. Puedes, puedes, dinos tu nombre también. Acordaos que las preguntas tienen que ser lo más breves posibles, por favor. <risa> tu nombre y de dónde y de dónde vienes. ¿Se, se, se oye tu voz? A ver, muy bien. Are you going to ask me in English? Yeah. Good. Thank you. <laughs> I approved my invitation. Uh, first of all, um, I'm Sergio. Uh, I, I'm, I come uh, from the ES Alonso de Avellaneda. Uh, I wanted to talk uh, that our school runs some Erasmus programs uh, consisting in the students going abroad uh, in the required internship. Uh, we usually um, find troubles uh, in looking for the accommodation and it's uh, really expensive so it's a really big investment from our families the question is uh, the Erasmus grants are the same that in other countries uh, considering the cost of living mm -hmm. uh, as per the big difference there are uh, so um, considering uh, equity rather than equality uh, thank you in advance for your answer Oh, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, I think that when I look back at my experience in Erasmus, it was the f four best months, five best months of my life, Sergio. Uh, I went to France. Uh, this was even before my country joined the European Union. It was in 2002, so many years ago, probably before. How many of you were born after 2002, before I start to feel really old? Okay, I start to feel really old. <laughs> So you see, when I was introduced as the youngest president, I'm 44, I'm not so young. Eh? <laughs> um, which also gives you an, an example as to what, uh, what's happening before me. So, um, already then, 20 years ago, Serho, we had a problem with differences in prices of accommodation. I remember uh, we realized that coming from a small, much poorer country at the time, we couldn't afford the accommodation in, in France, in Rennes. Uh, at the, uh, in, in those days, and we had to stay, I remember, four of us in one room for five months. It is still an issue, you are right. There has been an attempt, first of all, to broaden the amount of funds available allocated to Erasmus. I must tell you that the Parliament is a big ambassador of that push, because sometimes you see that at the moment we are, we are living through a big crisis, but the instinct of the big picture is to ignore the small subjects such as the research programs, the exchange programs, um, student um, funds that can be used. Um, change, I mean, um, uh, what possibility for you to move from one country to another, travel in a, in, with, with easier, um, uh, less difficult access. I would say that you will need to be a little bit louder on this, but I will take it and I will see whether this year any uh, improvement has been made on the coefficient, as we call it, between how much it costs to live, I would say, in Copenhagen, as when opposed to how much it would cost in another city in the European Union. What I would encourage you to do is to not let uh, yourself be hindered by the fact that you cannot go everywhere or anywhere. 
the most beautiful part about the European Union is the possibility for us to exchange experiences, speak different languages, travel, study elsewhere. I, I didn't study so much when I was an Erasmus, but I did learn French. I did learn French. And I remember one of the things that I remember most is that there were many, many UK students there from the United Kingdom who had just crossed the channel because this was in the north of France. And I remember, the first thing I remembered on the day of the Brexit referendum, I said, how will this impact United Kingdom boys and girls who just like us would like to study abroad? But this is a European Union miracle that took years to negotiate in order for us to be open, to have no borders, to move around. You remember COVID, first instinct, close the borders, stop. You can't, as though we thought a virus would be, you know, stopped by a police guard. But that was the instinct that we put on ourselves. So my message to you is look at Erasmus, use it, find the possibility to travel. The world is really at your feet and do whatever you wish to do. You know, when you grow older, it gets more difficult. Huh? I have four boys. Uh, yeah, maybe if they tell me, listen, I want to go on Erasmus, I'm going to be a little bit nervous, especially about a couple of them, because they're quite difficult, my sons. But I will, be able, I will have to be the first one to do, you know, what my parents did to me. Like, yes, go and travel. Go and speak different languages. Understand other people's cultures. This is the beauty of Europe, and this is the beauty of, of all of you. I want to ask you, how many of you are not Spanish here? Yes. Wow, good. Do you like living here? Yeah, well, you have to say yes. <laughs> you are in minority in this room. <laughs> it's beautiful, that better be. <laughs> it's wonderful, but look at the opportunity. Look where we are in the center of Europe. Spanish presidency coming up. Spain is, you know, central to everything we do in Europe. So push hard and we will see whether we can improve the coefficient. Okay? Thank you, Sergio. Yo también os recomiendo que hagáis la beca Erasmus, que me quedé con las ganas. Tenemos otra pregunta, una chica allí. Perfecto. ¿Y quién eres? Acuérdate de ser breve. Sí. <laughs> You're going to say this every time, breve. Every time, every time. But you didn't tell me this, huh? You need to tell <laughs> me that you I have to be short. You want. <laughs> Cuando quieras. Good afternoon. My name is Sofía Lozano and I'm a fourth year secondary student from Humanitas Bilingual School Torrejón. I like the names of your schools, you know, that they're very long, okay. <laughs> fourth, and yeah, okay. My school is part of the European Parliament Ambassador School Programme. And first of all, I would like to thank you all for including us in this wonderful ceremony and for listening to us, especially to you, Mrs. Roberta Mazzola. And in relation to my question, I would like to ask, what kind of aid does the European Union give to the young people in relation to uh, foreign exchange programs, financial help, assistance in the future degrees, and preparation for the European work field, working field? Sorry. And without having to go through all this excessive bureaucracy. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. You mentioned the word bureaucracy. That's one of the, the words that if I had to look at all the events that I've had with young people like you in all the cities that I've visited in my capacity as president, that's the word that's mentioned in everyone. Why? You are right. There is a lot. There are a lot of rules. There is a lot of paperwork. Even if it's online, we still call it paperwork. Um, there are, you can understand uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, ways that you have to make sure that the, the rules are not broken, but they are difficult to overcome and you will need help and you will need navigation. Once you learn how to do it, you can get through, but that's the biggest hurdle. And my appeal would also be to your school teachers and your headmasters and headmistresses is to be able to guide you through that. There is a lot of funds available for students like you. Whether it is, as we've just discussed with Erasmus, which when uh, we, we were young, it was very limited. You could only study the same subject, go to another university, come back and hope that the credits will be recognized. Now you can continue to do that when you graduate, when you, when you have a job to move um, either for sports reasons or for science reasons, research purposes, etc. In this, I mean, I can, I can also mention another personal experience. My two sisters are both scientists, they're academics. I'm the odd one out. Uh, I'm uh, the one, you know, they call me the, the fake doctor because I'm a doctor of law, not a doctor of science. Mm -hmm. But they uh, work a lot 
uh, with European uh, projects by connecting universities and edu academic institutions like this one together. There is nothing better than having um, similar profiles from different countries coming together and saying, look, we have one project that brings us all together. How can we fund it? How can we find um, the possibility to go that one step further to make Europe more competitive? What is one of the biggest obstacles we have today? What is one of the biggest hurdles? We are losing our competitiveness as European Union. When we look to the United States, when we look to other continents, we look to China, we'll see that we have lost the ability to be a leader in many, many, many areas, whether it's production, manufacturing, research, etc. But we're still leaders in creative industry, and we can still build and make the best products in the world. Uh, I think that we need to give that a boost in 2023. Our biggest asset, I said this in the Senate a few hours ago, uh, is our biggest asset is our people. It's you. And if we don't invest in you who are studying, who are breaking barriers, who are doing things that when I was young I couldn't even imagine being possible, then we would be doing a disservice to you. So there, being part of the European Parliament Ambassador Schools is a newish new project. Uh, it will allow you to meet uh, similar young people from different secondary schools throughout Europe. It is an absolutely amazing program. But what I also would tell you is taking it, take it beyond meeting people who are like you. Make friends and keep them. You know, some of my best friends I've known for 20 years. And that's because I met them in an event like this. And we found ourselves you know, late at night discussing European Union issues. I mean, people outside the room must have thought we were, I don't know. But we were in the parliament, we were outside, we were in Brussels or in Strasbourg, or even in, in Spain, I remember. We had, we had an event once with the Youth Forum in Alicante. So these are things you remember. And today, some of those people are prime ministers. I, some of them are, were actually there with me discussing 20 years ago. Things were maybe a little bit, let's say, less complicated at the time, but they got that experience and they ran with it. So look at what funds there are. Ask your teachers to show them to you. If they don't, write to me directly. And then last thing I will say is hold your leaders to account. So what I promise my voters, uh, and I come from a country with a very direct electoral system, is that don't only expect to see me the day before the election. You will see me during every year. You will see me at your local events. And if there's something that you don't like about what I'm saying, you tell me, because I'm accountable to you, because I have asked you to put your trust in me to be in the European Parliament and take decisions every day that matter to you. And that means that if our processes are not good enough, if they're too burdensome, if they are impossible to navigate through, then tell me. So identify the impossibilities and tell them to me, because less regulation remains our biggest, let's say, target. Have we reached it? We have a lot left to do. Tenemos más preguntas, una chica aquí. Hola. Buenas tardes, Buenas soy tardes. Jacqueline Martínez, venimos de Salamanca, de la red ACOGE. Eh, eh, espera un momentito que... que bueno, si quieres decir el nombre de tu escuela, vamos a ir. Sí. <risa> Won't be Re -re Repite tu nombre y de dónde eres para que te entienda mejor. Sí. Ok, soy Jacqueline Martínez, Hi, Jacqueline. venimos de Salamanca, de la red ACOGE. Y bueno, de acuerdo al nuevo pacto europeo sobre la migración y asilo en el que se centra más el control de fronteras y la devolución de personas, ¿cómo cree usted que se puede cambiar el enfoque y destinar más recursos a la integración de las personas migrantes, en especial a la juventud de países, a la, en, perdón, en especial a la juventud que ya está viviendo en países europeos? Muy bien, Jacqueline. Wait, wait, but it's, it's really... I don't know where the interpreter is. I, I can't reach it. So you asked me about migration, right? No, I can't hear. Migration, right? Yes. Um, migration, yes. And the pact. You mentioned the pact specifically, right? Um, so first of all, thank you for this question. This, this remains one of the biggest challenges we have. And I say it from a human perspective and also from a political perspective. 
In 2019, in every country, including in this one, the one request for the European Parliament elections, which we will have in 2024 again, was for solutions to be found for us to have a comprehensive and effective migration policy, for us to recognize our responsibility as Europeans, and for us also not to fall or not to allow voters to find comfort in the fringes of politics. Can you hear me? Can you understand me? Yes. What does this mean? We are being, we have one major challenge that we have the need for our societies to fill the gaps with persons for whom we will need workers to come from outside Europe. We need to have better systems for movement from one country to another. We need to be just and fair with persons who come to Europe for protection. We need to be firm with persons who are not eligible for protection. And we need to be extremely tough with human traffickers. Now, this might seem a lot, but there are considerations that I need to make as a politician who comes from a frontline state, but also as a leader of an institution that has members of the European Parliament that come from each and every country of the European Union with different realities, different geographical locations, different political pressures. What is my biggest fear? That we continue to look at persons who seek refuge in Europe as numbers. That we forget that behind every person in this world for whom Europe is the only hope, there is a face, there is a family, there is a decision that is made, that it is safer to go through the most dangerous routes in the world in order for maybe to find safety than to remain where you are and be persecuted for your ethnicity, for, your, for the fact that you are part of a minority, for your religious beliefs, for your sexual orientation. It pains me to say that until today, we still have not found one solution to this. Is it easy? Of course not. But if we have a responsibility as human beings to recognize that for a very large part of the world, where no free and fair elections exist, where hunger subsists, where wars are ongoing, Europe is the only hope. And that for us, in the European Union, we have to look outwards and not inwards. The easiest is to build walls. But when we do that, we also build them in our minds. And that's the danger that every election cycle, every possibility for a quick headline brings. That's the biggest challenge when you are an elected representative and have a responsibility to make sure that there is tolerance and understanding in the world. From a legal point of view, we still have a lot to do. There are still many laws that are open on the table, but they are laws that we can come to an agreement, whether it is on solidarity. We found solidarity when it came to 7 million Ukrainians, children, women and men, 3 million Ukrainians still in the European Union. We find solidarity with each other when we realize that we need to depend on each other for energy, for electricity. We find solidarity with each other when there is a natural disaster or an incident. 
the minute we talk about people, we lose our solidarity. We lose it. And that's the biggest challenge we have as a Europe in 2023 that has an obligation to you, to your generation, to the generations that come after you, that we were a Europe that opened its arms, like it opened its arms decades ago. Still a lot to do, but I'm hopeful. Mm -hmm. Every time I answer, there are more hands. That yes, can. yes. I, okay, we, we so quicker questions, time. quicker yes. replies, okay? Yes. I promise. I think that this girl has been waiting for a long time. Can you tell me your name and where you're from? No, this I can understand. But when it, uh, they start hi. speaking really quickly, I, I sort of lose. Hi, the, my name is Silvia. Uh, I am from an association whose name is Acción Castilla y León. Um, I, tr I will try to be quick. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, first of all, to be here, to be listening and answering all, all our questions. First, uh, some months ago, uh, three Spanish provinces, Soria, Teruel and Cuenca, uh, were recognized by the uh, European Union as the most depopulated of our country, of Spain. And as a consequence, uh, they benefit from some economic aids in order to generate employment in those areas. So my question, um, has the European Parliament studied the expansion of this recognition uh, to other Spanish areas that also suffer of um, very serious uh, depopulation problems? And on the other hand, other question. <laughs> uh, here in Spain, there are a lot of people. Which who, areas, which regions did you mention? Uh, Cuenca, Teruel and Soria, uh, three provinces for here in Spain. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm. I have second uh, question. Yes. Uh, well. On the other hand, uh, here in Spain, there are lots of people uh, who aren't aware of the functions or the influence uh, that your decisions of the European Parliament have in, in our daily lives. So, uh, how the European Parliament uh, can or have think about to reach these people, maybe um, young people or older, in maybe also in rural, rural or cities uh, here in Spain, to reach us and to make us be aware that the importance of your decisions in your daily lives. That's okay, awesome. thanks. So economic Thank aid, you. important. Um, we have developed over the years, but I, uh, this is something that was asked to me already earlier today. Uh, we need to make a, a big distinction in Europe between uh, and see how the economic disparities between urban metropolitan areas and more rural areas in order to avoid uh, that those rural, rural areas do not ha find that they have no other option but to move to main cities in order to find work, in order to have uh, access to basic services. In an area of digitalization, it is absolutely unbelievable that in some parts of Europe you still don't have connectivity. That's a reality, even though on paper they tell you it's not true, it's true. Uh, and that's what we are pushing in the European Parliament always in order to make sure that no part or corner of Europe uh, is left alone and that there is uh, economic aid that uh, is in national plans available across all countries and not just in specific areas. With regards to the specific towns that you mentioned, specific regions, you need to write them for me and then I will check. On the, on the impact on our votes, this is the permanent challenge of the European Union. When you see, how many of you have been in the Strasbourg plenary? The big plenary with, uh, yeah, and if you are wearing a blue top with the with yellow stars, it's obvious <laughs> you have been to the Strasbourg plenary. But anyone else? Not? So, uh, when you see it, how many of you have seen it on TV? You know, members of the European Parliament speaking in a sometimes fully empty room with blue chairs. Good, a bit more. I would like you one day to be sitting there. And I would also like you to hold your members of the European Parliament to account. Some of them are here, I can say it. Because I don't want you to only hear every five years that 80% of legislation that goes to the Spanish Parliament comes from Europe. Or that when something is really nice, your politicians say, you know what, it's thanks to me. But when it's really bad, they go, ah, it's Europe whatever Europe is, as though there's a difference between here and Europe or anywhere else. 
We should be proud of what we do in Europe. We should be proud of how we handled the pandemic. We should be proud of how we've handled the poly crisis situation we are in. This is a year when we should be cruising in economic growth. It's a year when Europe is going through a very difficult time. It's a year when we have, for almost now 365 days, just one minus one month, a war on our continent, a country that has invaded another, a population that looks to Europe as its home, a population that is fighting for our values. We decide the most ambitious climate legislation in the European Parliament. We vote on it. It's difficult, I can tell you. We vote on how much help financially we give to our businesses, our small enterprises that need help, our vulnerable parts of society, people who are falling under the poverty line, youth, young people who cannot find a job, Those are our priorities. We talk about them, we legislate. But then sometimes we forget to communicate. We sometimes forget to tell you, listen, by the way, that was us. Sometimes the decisions could be better. And if you knew that, you would be able to tell us. So this is why I'm here. This is why I don't just have, you know, fancy photos with flags and stuff. <laughs> I've done that for two days. I wanted to come here. I'm going to ask you a question now, but I want you to be honest. How many of you coming in thought to yourself that you would not vote in 2024? Don't, it cannot be that none of you did. It doesn't, you cannot be 100%. Can you reassure me that you will vote in 2024? Can I ask you one more difficult question? <laughs> Do your friends vote? I mean, I hope that your friends are not all in this room. Do your friends vote? No. Why not? They couldn't care? They don't know? They don't understand? Mm -hmm. They're not inspired? They don't think their voices matter? Can you convince five of your friends to vote in 2024? Otherwise, you can tell me. I'll give them a call. <laughs> I do that in my country. I call people <laughs> randomly. Hello. Sometimes I get a grandma who tells me, listen, my grandson doesn't want to vote. Disaster. I say, okay, give me the number. So they receive a phone call. Hello, I'm Roberta Metzola. Silence. <laughs> It works, huh? Don't look away. I think for many years, you know, politicians became comfortable. Oh, you know, don't worry, people will vote. Or I need X amount of votes to get elected. I stick with them. Not good. If you don't find inspiration to vote, then I'm failing you. How many of you will one day run for elections? How many of you are involved? Bravo, that's one, you. Get up, stand up. <laughs> don't be shy, bravo. How many of you are involved in an organization? Any kind, any cause. If you are willing to fight for any cause, then you should be willing to fight for your country. You should be willing to fight for what you believe in and for what you want to achieve. Otherwise, someone else will take the decision for on your behalf. You might not like the result. My appeal to you, irrespective of what you will do in Hulivo, irrespective, make a choice. Encourage people around you to make a choice. If you don't, you might not like the result. And then you cannot say, I don't believe in Europe anymore, and look at the decisions they are taking, because you have the possibility. Don't underestimate how many parts of Europe young people do not have this possibility to vote, to be able to vote someone out of office, but to be able to inspire someone to come in. No matter where you come from, no matter your background, no matter how No one in your family maybe has ever voted before. In my family, no one was ever in politics. I don't think they will ever be in politics, okay? After what I've gone through, but... I remember when I told my parents the first time. I was 24 when I ran my first election. Three weeks after Malta joined the European Union. I said, I'm going to run for the European Parliament. My parents are like, you are mad. Please don't. 
My father said, don't worry, she will not get elected. I didn't get elected the first time. I didn't get elected the second time. But I got elected the third time and the fourth time. And my aim is to get elected in 2024. But I have to work. I need to earn your trust. I need young people to say, you know what? There is something to Europe after all. But we need to communicate. We need to do things like this. Sorry, this was really long. I apologize. No, no. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> we have a lot of questions. So, so many more hands. Fenomenal. Animaros al aplauso. Sí. <laughs> Porque es verdad que del voto, de los votos de cada uno, se construye Europa y es una... That, are you concluding? Yes. <laughs> Why? Creo que tenemos eh, no. más tiempo para más. Eh, yes. Eh, te estoy viendo desde the, el principio. Pregunta, dice nombre. I have a, I have a police escort. I get really quickly with <laughs> in places in Madrid. Di tu nombre, de dónde eres okay. y oh. después... Are you going to speak Thanks in English, so right? Is, are you okay? Perfect. Yes, okay. We're going to use the English, so don't worry about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But <laughs> Thanks a lot. So, I'm Jesus. I'm the president of the European Federalists in Spain. And uh, actually, my question was related to democracy. Basically, we have seen some, let's say, complicated situations regarding democracy. For example, as was pointed out in the Moroccan resolution last week, or the Qatargate. And indeed, uh, you have been quite involved in the anti-strategic lawsuit uh, initiatives, uh, SLAPs. You know that? So you are very I would, well informed. You're Jeff, you said? Yes, from Obviously, Jeff. Obviously, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean. <laughs> so my question was, how do you think SLAPS initiatives could be improved and how those are related to the quality of democracy and our relationship with other states and countries? Okay, now, can you explain to your colleagues what SLAP are? <laughs> SLAPs are? Okay, basically those are uh, low-seat techniques that are applied in uh, judge... Uh, uh, let's say it in say, Spanish, say it in it? Spanish. Okay, could I? Of okay. course, because I know the answer, but they don't. So, actually, you know. I'm a lawyer, so it's a good Bravo. question. Bravo, go ahead, now, so, practice. Okay, I'm going to be super, super short. Básicamente son técnicas eh, en ámbito judicial para intentar obstruir la participación pública de activistas, Bravo. periodistas y similares. Did you understand it? Got it? <laughs> <laughs> Only you. lawyers, so I will... Uh, these are strategic lawsuits against public participation, which are aimed, you know, let's say, pointedly at intimidating journalists. What's the best way to try to stop a story that is not nice about you? Is you file a lawsuit in order to try to stop a journalist from continuing to ask questions. Fundamental pillar in our democracy, media freedom. Do I always like what journalists write about me? Of course not. But fundamental media freedom, principle, and a democracy. And what is happening too often in Europe is that if you are, you know, wealthy or you own a big company or you uh, decide that uh, you are a politician who you think that you are above the law because you make the law, is you try to shut a journalist down. It is becoming more and more difficult in Europe to be a journalist, to get paid well enough to be a journalist, to investigate even the toughest of stories. I know in my country, a journalist was killed for doing her job. When she was killed, she had 45 lawsuits filed against her. And until today, her children are, have inherited them and are fighting them. Still today, even though she was assassinated with a car bomb in broad daylight on the 16th of October, 2017. What can we do? That was your question, right? Well, the European Parliament had a choice a couple of years ago. Either wait for the European Commission, which is the initiator of laws, to come up with a law on media freedom, or do one ourselves. As an own initiative, we call it legislative reports, or non-legislative, independent, legal, whatever, we stop. I sometimes go into legalities. So myself and a colleague, so I was representing the um, Civil Liberties Committee, uh, which has a Spanish MEP as a chair, by the way, Juan Fernando um, López Aguiar, and uh, a, a, a German colleague who was in the Legal Affairs Committee, Timo Volken, and we said, let's try to report ourselves. And we did it, and today there's a proposal on the table, which is called the Media Freedom Act, which is inspired by the anti slap report that we wrote and voted on in plenary. But only you know, knew about it, Jesus, no one else. <laughs> it's my responsibility to make sure that when a report like that is voted on in the parliament, 
all of you know, not because you are a lawyer and you are in Jeff, and uh, I love Jeff because I spent a lot of time in it. Morocco resolution, yes. Um, in the parliament, we have seven political groups. We have 705 members coming from 27 countries. We pride ourselves with um, uh, our openness, our, our the fact how we legislate, how much we work, with differences of opinion, we find majorities, pro-constructive, pro-European constructive majorities in the center of the political spectrum, and we go through. But we have been rocked by a very, very difficult uh, and challenging scandal from the 9th of December. Now, I had a choice. I either say, I have inherited this system, or I say, it's my responsibility to fix it. And at the moment, we are going through an extremely challenging moment where we are clamping on the alleged um, uh, allegations of, of criminal corruption and, and big abuse, huge abuse of rules that were created for openness. Because openness built trust, but trust was lost like this. And we need to rebuild that because I also need to come and your colleagues, your representatives need to come to you in 2024 and say, we have fixed it. Will these things never happen again? Will there never be potential you know, criminal acts? This is a question as old as time. But the answer should be, what am I going to do to fix it? And that's what I'm doing now. With immediate measures, more shorter term, medium term and longer term measures. Because I want a modern and confident parliament. We are the ones that are directly elected. So the responsibility is even heavier on us. But we need people like you, Jesus, to put us on, uh, to hold us to account, to ask us questions like this. If you don't like the answer, ask it again. And if you still don't like the answer, ask it again. I mean, you don't have to do it now, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have no time. <laughs> yes. You can write to me. Send me a DM. My kids get so embarrassed when I say send me a sorry, DM. Sorry. It's like, oh, oh, you know nothing about Instagram, oh. Recuerdo que sois muchos like 55 ahí. hands. Sí. <risa> Por ejemplo, esta, esta chica que está aquí, eh, que la, sí, que estamos en línea. Eh, recuerda que tienes que decir tu nombre y tu pregunta muy breve. Que somos muchos, hay gente en otras dos salas y nos están viendo en streaming. Cuanto antes eh, terminéis la pregunta, mejor. Y yo también. Adelante. <risa> good evening. My Hi, good evening. Um, do you hear my name? No. Okay. Cindy. Cindy. Sí. My school is an ambassador school, it's here that we and we're really grateful of being here. Thank you very much. My question starts at, at the start of the Ukraine war, Ukraine asked to form part of the European Union, saying the main reason that w was that European membership would establish Ukraine firmly as an independent, sovereign European state. If the European Parliament accepts Ukraine, how would it affect us economic, economically and socially? What would affect us economically and socially? Yes. What? Uh, how, would it, how would it affect us? What is it? The war. The war. Ah, thanks. Okay, sorry, sorry. Cindy, I didn't hear you. Um, so, of course, the economic and social impacts are big. Uh, not only have we had to overcome the lack of attention we had paid before as to how dependent we were on Russia for gas, but also shone a light on countries like this that has invested a lot in renewables, that has been economic, uh, energetically very self-sufficient and, and always preached for interdependence rather than looking outside the European Union for solutions. The impacts will still be held, felt, felt, but at the same time, when I was in Kiev on the 1st of April, and I said, I'm going to go to, to Ukraine in order to, to show that we give hope and solidarity with Ukrainians in the face of an illegal and brutal invasion. The reality was that I got the hope and I got the solidarity from the most brave and resilient people I've ever seen. And you know why? Because for them, Europe is the only hope. And that when a country looks to Europe for hope, Europe has to fling its doors wide open. Seven million Ukrainians in Europe big impact, but we took them in, because that's what we do. We still have, them in, have children in our schools. We're still helping financially. At the moment, millions and millions of Ukrainians have no electricity, no clean water, no access to basic services. Why? Because they're being shelled every day. 
So I would say that, yes, we are dealing with an economically uh, and socially very impacted year, but we will look back and say that we were on the right side of history to help. And I'm proud of that. Más preguntas? A ver, vamos a elegir un chico ahora. Adelante, di tu nombre y de dónde eres. A que te acercan el micro, no te preocupes. Sí. Uh, thank you very much, President, for coming. It's an enormous privilege. I'm going to keep it very short. So ah. my question is also related... Are you Spanish? Uh, I'm English and Spanish, both. Um, <laughs> I'm a student here at IE, and you know, your question, am I Spanish, uh, reminds me of what you were saying about British students Absolutely. having access to Erasmus. Fortunately, I don't have that problem. But uh, <laughs> my question was also relating to democracy. So we know that an argument that lots of you know, political parties that are more Eurosceptic use is that the European Union isn't very democratic. Now, I'm not going to say that. I know the European Union is democratic, but I still think there's a lot of room for improvement. Uh, for a start, I don't personally recognize any MEPs. I only recognize two. But Do you recognize me now? I recognize you. Uh, but I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. members who sit around the round part of the plenary, I only recognize two. Um, but I wanted to ask, because legislative initiative, legislation initiative, is almost completely reserved to the European Commission and not to the European Parliament, uh, except for a few areas. So I wanted to ask, under your presidency, what's the European Parliament going to do to try and increase legislation initiative in the European Parliament? And then another quick question, which uh, you, you can answer in a second, is when you decided to run for the European elections, which is something I've been considering, but I'm not convinced because I don't feel like I fully align with any party. Did you run you know, independently? Did you run as part of a political party? How does it work? Thank you. <laughs> I see. Thanks for that. Are you also in Jeff? Uh, okay, I, I've been to a few Jeff events. Uh, I'm, I think I'm, get, I'm going to become a member of a Jeff. Jeffer. You're going to become a Jeffer. I'm going to become a Jeffer. But not sure. So, <laughs> legislative initiative. Only a Jeffer should, can ask about legislative initiative. It's amazing. So, the pa European Parliament is the only parliament that does not have full legislative initiative. I, it is something that pains me that we ask for because it needs to be decided by the governments and that is why in the context of the Conference of the Future of Europe, how many of you have heard of the Conference on the Future of Europe? Not bad, more than usual, okay. <laughs> it's why there was a, dis, a, a, a very strong message that if you are democratically elected, you're the one who can decide as to which laws you want to implement and write, just write, because being uh, a legislator means that you also get to write laws. Uh, we also, I would stretch it also to say that we, besides the right to initiative, we need a better right of inquiry, inquiry and better right of scrutiny. So, for example, we scrutinize the commissioners at the beginning of the mandate and at the end, but in the middle, if they don't want to come to a committee, they get away with it. So, as president, I actually have that role of saying, remind you, you are elected by the parliament and you are accountable to the parliament. Uh, with the slap example that I gave, it is, an, it is, for example, in the context of at the moment we're discussing an ethics body of how does it mean to be a public servant, what are the, uh, what are the rules that you place your, uh, upon yourselves. We are discussing the possibility of creating a legislative initiative there. But you are right that we do not have a full-fledged full -fledged possibility and we will not have before the treaty is created or before, let's say, a certain carve-out is created and we'll push for that. Right of inquiry, if something goes wrong, we have to ask. Uh, we ask actually already quite a lot of questions, but we do not have the same level of inquiry as other as national parliaments. Uh, and that is something that in a reform that we are undertaking, we are going to boost our resources in order to push towards that. When I ran for an MEP, no, I did not run as an independ independent. I ran as a Christian Democrat. Uh, I, in my country at the time, there had been a 10-year-long discussion as to Malta, as to whether we would join the EU or not. So the whole country was split right down the middle as to whether it was a good idea or not. For me and my generation, there was no question that the European Union membership would have a transformative effect on our country that would change everything that would bring up our standards, our quality of life, our possibility to do everything else. Now, I remember the arguments against were, oh, we're so small and we'll be swallowed up. Our voice won't be heard. 
Look at other countries. I'm here today. So my choice was very clear, that I would run on the list of the party that had been in favor of joining the EU from day one. The other party was not. So for me, that was no question. But going back to you don't know whether to run, you will always find a home somewhere. Just take your time. And if you want to start your own movement, go ahead as well. But you will find your home. You will find your home. Okay. Creo que tenemos un tiempo para alguna pregunta One más more. y es difícil elegir but we, but quién. Pero ahora tenemos 75 manos. ¿Qué te gusta? ¿Qué te gusta? No, I, I, I no you the, the, the you see my the people choose. at the back of the room, they're like going... Ok, ok. Pues eh, vamos a ver, eh, por ejemplo... Eh, I don't know, I have some... Misma, I, have very, I have an official esa, meeting ella, next. Ella, ella, sí. I have a, a big <laughs> meeting next. Go ahead. Es muy difícil. Um, my name is Aurora. I'm from the Master of in Journalism uh, ah, from the um, El Mundo, the newspaper in Spain. Hi, Aurora. And following one of the questions before, uh, how is the war in Ukraine affecting the creation of employment for young people in Europe and what are the solutions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aurora. So, Um, what we have realized uh, ever since the 24th of February when Russia invaded Ukraine is that we need to go faster on the so-called digital and green transition. Big words, right? But during the pandemic, we allocated a huge amount of funds in order to help member states um, such as Spain and all other countries of members of the European Union to come out of the pandemic economically stronger. But to do that, you needed help. How do you get that help? By making sure that proper investment is done in digital investment and climate ambitions. Why? Because first of all, we've always spoken about green ambition or the climate or the green deal, as we call it, as something far away from economy. We've always spoken about digital transition as something that is reserved for some countries and not for others also because there were big gaps. But what we realized over this past year is that let's get the momentum and the impetus to go faster in order for us to finally realize that green growth also means more jobs. And digital growth also means more jobs. And there is not, not, not one sector of our population that can benefit more than the youth. So it will take... It has taken some countries longer than others. It will still take countries longer than others to reach their target. But at least the framework is there. And that how we have uncoupled ourselves from full dependence on Russia um, uh, one year ago, we are now self-sufficient. How we have managed to invest into our own resources and identify new mixes, that's thanks to us. So growth, And creation of employment is dependent on our courageous effort to unplug ourselves from the past, literally. Okay. Apparently we need to go, because now they're really jumping up and down at the back of the room. Eh, no tenemos tiempo para más. La presidenta está en una visita oficial, como os decía, y le están esperando eh, dentro de nada. En Next time we'll finish with this rather than yes. Pero os quería dar las gracias a todos por haber sido tan amables, tan generosos. Y thank you very much, President, for your generosity. You are amazing. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Gracias. También al Instituto de Empresa por este espacio maravilloso que además nos ha estado regalando esta luz. Well This, the night. sun, the light is marvelous. And uh, we have uh, the last question for you, President. Sure. Do, do, do you, are you ready for a picture with all these young people? I, I, I'm a politician. Eh? I mean, of course I'm ready for a photo. <laughs> That's the oh, best question you. you can ask for. So how do we do it? Nos hacemos un okay, selfie todos. ¿Os apetece? Sí, pues vamos a darnos un selfie. Poneros, yo creo que os podéis poner incluso de pie, ¿sí? Stand-ups. Sí. Espera. Ah, sentados. Sentados, perdón, sentados, mejor. Aquí. Bueno, yo voy a hacer un selfie. Yo, yo voy a hacer primero un selfie. A ver, a ver, ahora, 
¿Sí? Ok, ¿no? Venga, acá Ok. <risa> Sí, más alguna persona. ¿Podríamos ir haciendo?